I think it's a civilization that went back deep into the last ice age, maybe as far back as 100,000 years into the past. Could there have been an ancient civilization that was so advanced that it spread what it knew far across the world? I think that the ancient civilization I'm talking about had great respect for, the, for its roots, for its origins. Well, according to Graham Hancock, that's a reality he believes in. Join us as we uncover the truth behind this ancient civilization and everything Graham has revealed over the years. How solid are his claims and what do archaeologists say about them? Introduction to Graham Hancock and his theory. He's becoming known throughout the world as Graham Hancock pushes the boundaries of conventional archaeology and history, delving into astronomical alignments, geological phenomena, and mysterious architectural wonders. He proposes that these elements point towards a far greater level of sophistication in ancient civilizations than what is presently recognized by researchers. But his most interesting theory is that of a past global civilization that enabled cross-continental contact and knowledge exchange even on the African continent. After all, Graham Hancock firmly believes that we suffer from a species with amnesia. He argues that our present civilization isn't the first sophisticated, globally encompassing society to have existed on Earth. But instead, he believes that a remote civilization, now entirely lost to history, flourished in the distant past. Seems crazy, right? About 12,800 years ago, Society faced a devastating event known as the Younger Dryas, a natural catastrophe. As the planet was gradually recovering from its ice age, there was a sudden and steep drop in global temperatures due to rapid climate change. Such an event impacted every creature that lived on the Earth, and the human survivors of this disaster dispersed across the world, passing down their knowledge to our hunter-gatherer ancestors. While this cooling event is typically attributed to natural cycles, there's another viewpoint that suggests something completely different. Some say it might have been triggered by a massive extraterrestrial collision, but Hancock's not one of those people. Instead, in his perspective, the Younger Dryas civilization serves as a pivotal point in the birth of human achievements. Agriculture, architectural marvels, you name it. But perhaps the most important of these advancements was the formation of countless global myths. These emissaries, which humans like to call gods or giants, assume the roles of iconic figures such as Prometheus and Quetzalcoatl. Their influence echoes through the captivating legend of Atlantis, a myth that continues to captivate our imagination even today. The profound impact of the younger Dryas civilization is still clear in the monuments they've inspired, like the majestic Great Sphinx of Giza and the Cuicuilco Pyramid in Mexico. Hancock fully maintains that these unique structures significantly predate the timelines accepted by mainstream scientific consensus, pushing the boundaries of our understanding of ancient history. But that's not all. Graham Hancock's previous work. Graham Hancock's journey to becoming a prominent figure in discussions about pyramids, apocalypses, and ancient civilizations has been a fascinating evolution. You might be surprised to hear that it's not where he began. In 1985, his debut book talked about the pressing issue of famine in Ethiopia, demonstrating a commitment to societal concerns. After this, he authored Lords of Poverty, a scathing critique of the humanitarian aid industry, claiming that it helped the global bureaucratic elite, but ignored the plight of the world's impoverished populations. In fact, Hancock's early career placed him squarely on the British left, as he reported on African affairs, for publications like The Economist, and interestingly, cited Marx's ideas in the pages of The New Internationalist. This period was marked by a focus on socio-political issues. But here's where things changed because by the early 1990s, his interests took a major turn. He shifted his focus from contemporary problems to the exploration of ancient artifacts and mysteries. That's a big change, but this transformation paved the way for his many contributions, which include best-selling books, multiple appearances on Joe Rogan's podcast, and even a Netflix series titled Ancient Apocalypse, showcasing his unique views on our shared human history. It may appear as an unexpected shift, but Graham believes that his fundamental perspective remains consistent. After all, he describes himself as a contrarian, someone who has consistently challenged prevailing norms. 
In the 1980s, openly criticizing foreign aid was similar to questioning a universally accepted idea. So he reasons that he continues this contrarian spirit, though his main topic has transitioned from contemporary events and political issues to the mysteries of the ancient world. But where did this new field of passion begin? The beginning of his work on the ancient civilization. Well, his initial brush with the ancient world happened during his coverage of the 1984 famine in Ethiopia. Graham's curiosity was piqued when he stumbled upon a story from that time, the Ethiopian belief that they possessed the lost Ark of the Covenant. I came across the Ethiopian claim to possess the lost Ark of the Covenant, uh, which I found that archaeologists sneered at, and yet it was central to Ethiopian culture. Ethiopian tradition maintains that the revered Ark of the Covenant, a significant religious artifact, finds its sanctuary in the ancient and sacred city of Aksum. This belief has lasted through the centuries, with the historic Church of Mary of Zion being the designated guardian of this invaluable relic. The accounts of Emperor Iyasu dating back to 1691 stand as a testament to the connection with the Ark, as he is said to have both held and talked to it within the walls of the church. Hancock had a gut feeling that there might be truth to their claims, so he found himself leading a double life for a period. While he was reporting on food policy, he was also actively pursuing the Holy of Holies. This pursuit eventually transformed from a mere side project into an unexpectedly successful book. Graham Hancock's proposed ancient civilization from the Ice Age is characterized by a level of advancement, yet it's not excessively sophisticated. While they might have tackled challenges like the longitude problem, it's not guaranteed that they possessed metal tools. What's the longitude problem, you might ask? Well, you might already know how latitude and longitude serve as crucial navigational tools for traveling the globe. Latitude is determined by the fixed point of the equator, making it relatively straightforward to gauge even when at sea, using factors like the length of the day or the position of the sun. But in comparison, longitude is much more dynamic, shifting as the Earth rotates. It moves approximately one degree every four minutes, so you can see why it presented a big challenge in ancient times. Establishing longitude, particularly while at sea, was once considered an unsolvable problem, like a quest for the fountain of youth or the alchemical pursuit of turning lead into gold. This issue of determining longitude plagued sailors for centuries, and it's not difficult to figure out why. The inability to precisely establish longitude led ship captains to rely on a method known as dead reckoning, essentially a form of educated guesswork, where they steered the ship based on their instincts. As a result, ships were confined to a limited number of known safe routes as the lack of accurate longitude information made navigation a dangerous job. So, they might have solved problems like these, but complex tools and creations are a different field altogether. Coming back to Hancock's theory of the ancient civilization, he specifically avoids making some theories, like those of aliens in the ancient world, or microchips being put in our brains. When discussing individuals who do make such grand claims, Hancock's usual friendly demeanor gives way to frustration. He expresses strong feelings towards what he calls the ancient aliens lobby, as he believes their theories have damaged the credibility of the entire field, causing it to be seen as a subject of mockery. So much much truth is in his statements, and his own theory of a lost civilization hidden under the sand. About his show Ancient Apocalypse In 2022, Netflix launched Ancient Apocalypse, an eight-part documentary series written and hosted by the best-selling author. The series has some great production values, featuring superb editing, top-notch graphics, captivating music, and a brilliant voiceover. The cinematography is stunning, highlighted by breathtaking aerial shots that improve the overall presentation. It's definitely worth a watch since the series only has eight 30-minute episodes, each with a catchy title. The first episode, titled Once There Was a Flood, delves into the Indonesian archaeological site of Gunung Padang. Hancock explores the possibility that this site was once inhabited by a lost civilization during the time when it was part of the larger landmass known as Sundaland, which he believes was devastated by a cataclysmic event. In the second episode, Stranger in a Time of Chaos, Hancock turns his attention to the Mexican pyramid of Cholula, a massive structure. He presents the pyramid as harboring signs of a mysterious past, suggesting connections to the mythic hero Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl is believed to have arrived by ship following a catastrophic flood, bearing with him ancient wisdom that he shared with the survivors. 
The third episode, Sirius Rising, takes an interesting turn as it focuses on the megalithic temples of Malta. Hancock proposes that these temples were once interconnected and much older than conventional archaeology suggests. What Graham believes is that these structures prove the existence of previous astronomical knowledge that Westerners only recently discovered. Continuing with the fourth episode, Ghosts of a Drowned World, we get to see more evidence for the existence of Atlantis. The Bimini Road, situated off the coast of the Bahamas, usually regarded as a natural rock formation, is argued by Hancock to be an ancient megalithic platform. What's more, it's even possibly a remains of the legendary Atlantis. He supports this claim with a map indicating that ancient civilizations were aware of the Americas long before Columbus. Isn't that surprising? The fifth episode is what's truly the hallmark of Hancock's theory, though. The episode titled Legacy of the Sages talks about the mysterious site in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe, agreed upon by mainstream archaeologists to be thousands of years older than any other megalithic structure in the world. Well, this site has a lot more to it than what meets the eye, or at least that's what the author believes. Gobekli Tepe Well, some of what he says is true. There have indeed been lost civilizations in history. Take for example the Harappan civilization in the Indus Valley. It's a well-documented civilization with impressive advancements such as indoor plumbing, sophisticated sewage systems, and large public buildings. But the reasons for the eventual abandonment of their cities remain uncertain. The existence of a script-like system in their inscriptions remains undeciphered, leaving us with a trove of messages from the distant past that we're unable to understand. It's also true that new discoveries frequently challenge and change our understanding of official history. An excellent example is the archaeological find in Turkey known as Gobekli Tepe, featuring circular enclosures with massive stone pillars adorned with animal forms. This site, dating back about 7,000 years earlier than Stonehenge, has forced a revision of our timelines and perceptions of early human civilizations. Such discoveries remind us that our understanding of the past is continually evolving as new evidence comes to light. Around 12,000 years ago, during a time when giant glaciers blanketed Earth's northern hemisphere, a remarkable chapter in human history unfolded in southern Turkey. A group of resourceful hunter-gatherers started on a task, constructing what is now recognized as the world's earliest known temple, Gobekli Tepe. The complexity and sheer magnitude of Gobekli Tepe have interested archaeologists since its discovery in 1994. Unearthing this ancient wonder has been a long journey, with every excavation revealing more about its mysterious nature. The site boasts some interesting features, including intricate animal carvings, huge stone pillars, and perhaps most importantly, the earliest evidence of megalithic rituals. Despite over two decades of dedicated research, the mysteries surrounding Gobekli Tepe stay, challenging the experts to go deeper into the past and crack the secret concealed within its ancient stones. So we must ask ourselves, who built it and why? History of Gobekli Tepe Gobekli Tepe, with its unique design and ancient origins, has fascinated the public for many years. Its allure has sparked extensive press coverage and documentaries, along with countless theories that range from extraterrestrial involvement to notions about a sophisticated, ancient civilization. But wait, there's more. While the core group of archaeologists involved in the site's excavation maintains a more grounded perspective, some other scientists, less directly connected to the project, have made some shocking speculations. Among these ideas are suggestions that Gobekli Tepe might have served as an astronomical observatory or even been linked to the biblical Garden of Eden. This makes a connection to both celestial wonders and ancient mythologies. When questioned about the nature of his imagined ancient society, Hancock displays an unusual level of reserve. He prefers not to speculate and instead relies on the available evidence. Certain fringe theorists, influenced by writers such as Rian Eisler or the Lithuanian anthropologist Maria Gimbutas, have suggested the idea that this lost civilization was a harmonious, matriarchal, partnership society, contrasting with the aggressive, acquisition-focused, dominator societies that emerged later and which persist in our world today. Graham acknowledges this perspective, describing it as quite sensible, and then quickly shifts the conversation to the topic of megalithic sites in Turkey. After all, another intriguing site in Turkey is Darin Kuyu, an underground city featuring an extensive labyrinth of tunnels. Hancock even mentioned this site in Ancient Apocalypse, 
and claimed that Darren Kuyu served as survival bunkers for the people, who faced relentless attacks from cometary debris around 12,800 years ago. So where's the proof for this? Could it be linked to an ancient civilization? Those who believe in the astronomical links of Gobekli Tepe point to two major claims that support their perspective. The first revolves around the site's alignment with the night sky, specifically focusing on the star Sirius. This alignment is attributed to the local people's worship of Sirius, a practice that has a similarity to later cultures in the region, stretching back thousands of years. The second claim is about the complex carvings found at Gobekli Tepe, suggesting that they serve as a historical record of a massive comet impact that occurred as the Ice Age was coming to an end. This theory offers an explanation for certain features at the site, joining Earth's ancient past with a cosmic event that would have no doubt had an impact on the planet's natural environment. Both claims contribute to the mystery surrounding Gobekli Tepe and have caused discussions among researchers and enthusiasts alike. If either of these were accurate, the site would stand as the world's most ancient recognized astronomical location. But there's a problem here. The primary team involved in the actual excavation of the temple largely rejects the claims regarding its connection to the night sky, and there's a big reason for that. According to these experts, while the archaeological site remains well-preserved, the passage of time has led to changes in the positioning of certain pillars. Yes, evidence suggests that some of the pillars were removed and put in other locations. Then there's the fact that as the population around the area grew and changed, they rearranged segments of specific pillars, even causing some pieces to break off. These changes over the centuries have caused problems in understanding the site's original purpose and alignment with astronomical phenomena. After all, researchers have been doing their best to do so. They have made a lot of efforts to reconstruct the original positions of Gobekli Tepe's pillars, but the exact arrangement of the site's circular structures remains a topic of ongoing debate. So the current state of affairs prevents archaeologists from definitively deciding whether the site actually held any astronomical purpose or not. But for the team responsible for surveying Gobekli Tepe, there doesn't need to be a connection. The site continues to be a source of wonder for them, offering valuable insights into the ancient past, regardless of whether it was actually aligned with the stars. The main takeaway is how archaeologists previously believed that complex societies, structures, and religions arose only after agriculture's invention. But as we've just talked about, Gobekli Tepe challenges this view. Positioned in the Fertile Crescent, known for key developments like farming and writing, the site defies the norm. It predates regional farming, so this pre-agricultural society is definitely a question mark. At first glance, Gobekli Tepe appears to be an average hill, leading researchers to initially dismiss a few modest stone structures found on its top during the 1960s. In 1994, while finishing work on a nearby Stone Age site, Klaus Schmidt from the German Archaeological Institute took a new look at the hilltop. What he discovered was truly shocking. He recognized familiar parts in the few remains on the surface, hinting at the possibility of more concealed underneath. And in the years that followed, the magnitude of his discovery caught researchers off guard. It was found that the entire hill was the result of human construction. Beneath the mound lies a collection of structures scattered across a large area, approximately 1,000 feet in width and 50 feet in height. The ancient builders of this site meticulously crafted large, intricately decorated stone circles, but later concealed them under layers of sand. What makes this discovery so groundbreaking is how Gobekli Tepe couldn't have been constructed by farmers, since farming didn't yet exist during that period. Plus, the absence of domesticated pack animals or metal tools meant that the site was made using basic, rudimentary instruments and the labor of human hands, making the achievement even more impressive. So, being 12,000 years old at least, the site predates humanity's oldest recognized civilizations. Its megalithic temples were carved from rock long before iconic structures, like the 4,500-year-old pyramids in Egypt, the 5,000-year-old Stonehenge in England, or the 7,000-year-old Nabta Playa, the oldest known astronomical site. And get this, there are even indications that construction on certain parts of Gobekli Tepe might have started as far back as 14,000 or 15,000 years ago. This changes the timeline researchers have considered the sacred truth for a long time now. 
But things become weird here, as there's no evidence suggesting that people actually lived here. No burials or homes have been found on the site, so scientists have turned to the surrounding countryside to gain insights into the identity of who made these structures. Their findings indicate that Stone Age hunter-gatherers in the region, for centuries before the appearance of Gobekli Tepe, seemed to be establishing small, permanent settlements where they lived together. They survived by sharing their foraged resources with each other. If this pattern is true, it could suggest that such communal sharing played a crucial role in the formation of society. Yet, a big question remains unanswered. Why did hunter-gatherers from these nearby communities seemingly collaborate in significant numbers to construct Gobekli Tepe? Well, the answer to this question remains one of the most fascinating mysteries surrounding the site. In the present day is no different. But while we may not have uncovered the whole truth, the fact remains that our understanding of ancient civilization and history wasn't as accurate as we thought. Stone Age societies were more advanced than previously believed, and the traditional history of gradual development, from nomadic to settled farmers to complex societies, is likely wrong. Researchers believed that advancement came later, when established agricultural communities allowed surpluses to be generated. This helped in freeing up people to become architects, engineers, site managers, etc. But now, due to this fascinating find in Turkey, we know better. Many are divided about his claims, but the man puts it in simple words. Bottom line, I don't claim I'm right, Graham says. My role has been to explore an extraordinary possibility. While Hancock has been certainly exploring the extraordinary, that doesn't mean all researchers are in favor of these theories. The Gobekli Tepe site does pose some interesting questions, but there are other aspects of this alternative theory to consider. The criticism about his theory. Graham suggests that this civilization was nearly destroyed by a comet impact around 12,000 years ago, leaving no evidence other than what he believes to be a cryptic warning of a similar catastrophe for our era. This concept forms the core of his book, Magicians of the Gods, and the author's British accent and engaging storytelling style in the audio edition are undoubtedly compelling. His way of both writing and narrating makes the book an easy read, but there's a degree of skepticism about these claims, and there are a few reasons why. First, it's challenging to accept that all the remains of a highly advanced civilization, including tools, artifacts, clothing, advanced technology, writing, and everyday trash, would have completely vanished after flourishing for centuries just because of a catastrophic extraterrestrial impact. Hancock's impact hypothesis, introduced by scientists in 2007 to account for the extinction in North America during that time frame, has been met with a lot of scientific scrutiny. Regrettably, it hasn't stood up well under this scrutiny, casting some doubt on its validity. But that's not the only issue. Other than the absence of any confirmed impact craters, from that period all over the globe, the radiocarbon dating of the carbon layer has found a few inconsistencies. Samples including soot, charcoal, nano-diamonds, microspherules, and iridium, attributed to the catastrophic event, all showed one thing. The dates don't match. These dates vary before and after the extinction, spanning a wide range from approximately 14,000 to 10,000 years ago. Plus, the pattern of extinctions in North America, where 37 mammal genera disappeared, contrasts with the extinction events in South America. There, 52 mammal genera went extinct, probably not due to the impact. Instead, these extinctions align more closely with the timing of human arrival, supporting the prevailing hypothesis of overhunting as a major contributing factor. After analyzing Hancock's argument, we see that it relies mainly on two kinds of reasoning, the argument from ignorance and the argument from personal incredulity. The argument from ignorance says that because scientists can't explain something, Graham's theory is valid, and the argument from personal incredulity claims that because he can't explain one phenomenon, his theory must be right. This kind of reasoning resembles what creationists do, but in Hancock's case, he suggests that ancient people brought civilization. But there are issues with this approach. The first is how scientists do have reasonable explanations for some of Hancock's points like the pyramids and the Great Sphinx, even if they're not fully agreed upon. Another issue is how a theory should be supported by positive evidence, rather than just being against accepted ideas. As mentioned before in the video, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey is Hancock's primary example, with its massive stone pillars, when people were mostly hunter-gatherers. 
Graham suggests that they couldn't have built it with their knowledge and skills, so an advanced civilization existed over 12,000 years ago, spreading knowledge worldwide. This idea definitely sounds appealing, but it assumes low expectations for what hunter-gatherers could achieve. After all, we can't definitively say what they were capable of. There's also another aspect to consider, Gobekli Tepe was a ceremonial and religious site, not a city. In fact, there's no indication that anyone lived there at all. With no traces of domesticated animal bones, tools, or inscriptions, there are no hallmarks of advanced civilizations. Coming back to his Netflix show, there are a few other interesting locations to consider too. For more evidence from Graham about this ancient civilization, look at America's history in episode 6 and 8. The episode, titled America's Lost Civilization, explores various structures in North America, particularly highlighting Serpent Mound in Ohio and Poverty Point in Louisiana. More evidence of ancient civilizations, so what does Hancock think about them? In the eyes of the renowned ancient history author, these structures have far older origins than what mainstream archaeologists propose. This suggests they bear the legacy of an ancient civilization possessing advanced astronomical knowledge. And there's more. In Episode 9, Hancock, along with his colleague Randall Carlson, examines multiple geological features in the channeled scablands of the western United States. They see this as direct evidence of a cosmic event, which they believe wiped out nearly all signs of the advanced civilization that thrived during that time. The series ends dramatically, that's for sure. Hancock once again delivers a powerful message to modern society. The return of a comet could potentially have the same impact on us as it did on the Atlanteans. And as history shouldn't be repeated, Graham wants humanity to prepare for this possibility now. While he's one of the faces of the dark side of archaeology, his reinterpretation of world history isn't the only one out there. There's the Phantom Time Hypothesis, which argues that the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries AD never happened. Yep, you heard that right. Unlike Hancock's theory, this hypothesis significantly reshapes a familiar historical narrative, suggesting that figures like Charlemagne and even the early Middle Ages were fabricated by the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III, leading us to live in the year 1725 instead. Yet, Anatoly Fomenko's new chronology thesis takes the cake. A Soviet mathematician, Fomenko believed he'd identified hidden numerical patterns in history. He proposed that seemingly distinct accounts of rulers in different cultures were actually referring to the same individuals. In Fomenko's unconventional view, ancient Israel, Pharaonic Egypt, and the Byzantine Empire were one and the same. He suggested that historians had merely arranged these parallel accounts in a timeline and we'd all been fooled. In fact, get this, in Fomenko's version, Jesus Christ was born in Crimea and crucified on a hill in Istanbul around the year 1185. Compared to these bold ideas, the Graham Hancock account seems almost modest, doesn't it? Conclusion But no doubt the author is a polarizing figure, reeling in his viewers and readers. Much like the wise ancient humans, he envisions once thrived on our planet. His intelligence is obvious, driven by a deep-seated belief that he has unearthed a major revelation about humanity's past, carrying some serious implications for our future. And despite the criticisms from some in the field, it's important to recognize that Hancock is far from just a pseudoscientist. While his alternative theories about history may raise some eyebrows, there's a place within the scientific discourse for alternative voices to challenge the established status quo. This role is held by those who bring fresh perspectives, drive innovation, spark critical thinking, and bring on the advancement of our understanding of the world around us. The scientific landscape benefits from a diversity of ideas and Hancock's unconventional views and the unique dynamic of challenging accepted norms is a fundamental aspect of scientific progress, ensuring that our understanding of the past, present, and future remains ever-evolving. This is a constant part of the scientific process that will continue to improve our understanding of the world, even in the face of doubt and controversy. That's all. Thanks for watching.